Okay, so the idea is that at the very beginning, these students are pretty clueless about problems of this kind, and they just randomly occasionally get the right answer. When they get to be about this, this age, they're systematically doing the wrong thing, and that produces the dip. And that's what's going on in the model, too. But interestingly, as learning continues, the model continues to be trained with this corpus, even though the bias is still present in the corpus. Ultimately, the model is getting these examples that it's not getting right, and it's getting an error signal about what the right thing to do is, and so gradually it learns its way out of that hole, and it shows uh, uh, improvements. Um, so that's what I just said. We didn't change the statistics as the thing was going along. It's learning to use the infrequent information correctly, because ultimately that it's still making mistakes with that, and that's driving it. Okay. The model also, I am no amount of time, produces an illusion of thinking it's seeing the equal sign. Um, this graph illustrates that fact. Basically, when the equal sign really is there, really strongly activates it. When the equal sign isn't there in the second position, where it usually is an equal sign, early on in training, it thinks it's there. Um, not quite as strongly as when it's actually there. Um, but as learning progresses, it learns to actually represent the signal that's there. Okay. So, at first, the model exhibits this at all strategy and it exhibits these illusory uh, correlations. Um, and it gradually overcomes these tendencies, as children do. As experience. So, you know, learning to encode, even when infrequently given the right thing, can ultimately, as the experience, help. Of course, if you change the biases in the training set, that would be sensible. Um, now, there's many limitations to this work, work so far. We have a single parallel settling process, and I, I sort of assume myself that, you know, if there's more than two add-ins there, you kind of add the first two, and then you add the next one. So there is a sequentiality that isn't present right now in our model. Um, we, I kind of think of that sequential pattern as being itself a habit, and the model doesn't quite have that capability yet. But, um, so I think the principles are still right, but um, our representations of number aren't great, and the model doesn't quite get to adult level performance, so people could criticize for that reason. Um, there's a lack of interface to explicit propositional statements. Now, many people you know, might think that, okay, if you just have the explicit propositions in mind, that would you know, really guide your thinking. Uh, well, my tendency is to think that they redirect attention, they change the biases in the system, they might change the way you behave right now in this particular instance, but when that verbal prompt isn't there or when you fail to bring it to mind, these tendencies are still present, right? And these errors are going to have to be eliminated by the virtue of actual practice doing these problems and eliminating the error and not just by having a conscious rule in your head that you sometimes So there should be a role for that stuff, but it's not what eventually works in the way of the experience. Uh, we don't have an interface to visual spatial representations, which I emphasized at the beginning of the talk are very important. I think these habits of mind aren't just a matter of pattern completion on expressions, like I told you before. Um, and that's something we're really working on uh, for the future. So I know I'm out of time, but just <laughs> to say that there are implications for education. So education should emphasize objects and relations in the world that Expressions map to. I'll read it off the slide. <laughs> there. <laughs> Mapping into the world rather than blindly manipulating symbols and establishing solid ground before building more. You basically you need to kind of let kids build up their knowledge of these things before you try to build on it. Right? And it's not necessarily the case that it all gets sinks in uh, quickly. It needs time. <laughs> yeah, Google can do magic. Right? <laughs> um, so I deep apologies for being late. I'm stuck in traffic. I um, want thanks so much for stepping up and taking care of everything. And Mike <laughs> and Rob and Anna. Well, Mike decided you should go first. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. So you're gonna get the introduction after having already been introduced. But um, basically, the idea behind these set of talks is that um, 
thinking a bit more about what the value is of competition models, particularly since there's been a... Joseph, why don't you let people come in if they want to sit oh, yeah. in? So actually, yeah, please, stream in. If you'd like to sit <laughs> on the floor, just place on the floor. It's up to you. It makes it seem like an extremely popular talk instead of a very small room. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so the motivation behind this um, set of talks is that thinking about what the value of competition modeling might be for psychology more generally, but in the context of learning, given that there's so many changes happening now in terms of what kinds of data we can collect about human behavior with technology and apps and online um, environments, and also the fact that there's been a lot of change recently in competition modeling, from connectionist models to Bayesian models. Um, there's a lot of changes that go on as computer science and machine learning come up with new techniques, and we're rethinking how to use old ones. Um, and especially, there's always been a trade-off where competition models have value in terms of being able to precisely specify what hypotheses uh, or processes and representations we are uh, speculating about. But then there's a big trade-off in that the scope of the phenomena we can use to address them is quite restricted. So you can get rigorous, but then you address a very narrow frame. And what I think is nice is that as we see these new models, and in particular kinds of data we collect, we can start to address more complex phenomena. In fact, even make predictions about railroad applications, as you see, for example, in Mike's talk. And might also have a lot more relevance than there's been in the past. So that's what we're really excited about. And so in terms of the... Um, particular talk that I'm going to present. This is a um, secondary analysis of a data set that's connect, collected the, in which we conduct an experiment. And this is pretty at a pretty early stage, but I think the main idea here is to communicate the kinds of data we can uh, start analyzing if we look at online environments and some preliminary results from that. So this is work um, done in collaboration with uh, John Mitchell, the Vice Provost for Online Learning and Jaja Soldixin, who's at Stanford and also at Khan Academy, which is one of these online education platforms that offers videos and exercises. And so um, I'm going to describe the experiment that we conducted, which you could even think of as just a standard psychology experiment. But um, the particular theme of this was actually, how can we insert messages that teach us for the models of intelligence in a way it helps them learn? And then start to think about, well, now that you conduct this experiment, this sort of high-dimensional environment, how can we start pushing down on asking questions that we wouldn't be able to ask from a typical psychology experiment? So this is the experimental paradigm that we explored, um, which took a lot of looking at the platform and, and fiddling around and seeing what was technically easy and what the affordances were. But basically, uh, you, if you've heard of Khan, how many people have heard of Khan Academy? And you might have heard about them in the context of their videos. They've got a whole section of these sites that's actually math exercises. And as an experimental psychologist, um, you guys might light up when you see this. Because even though um, it's not really clear at first what instructional variables you can manipulate, it's a really rich paradigm for collecting data. In particular, um, let's, this math, this kind of template of math problem is across every math exercise in the site. So 300 exercises from early um, adding and subtracting all the way up to calculus. So basically, when you solve a problem, they show this on screen. It's a there's a statement. So the grades in a history midterm were normally distributed with a particular mean standard deviation. Christopher got a 69. How can you find the z-score for Christopher's exam grade? And so what you do at this point is plug in the answer, and if you're an excellent student, you get it right on the first try, and then you move on to the next problem. So the next problem would be it, most likely it's going to be the same template, but with the numbers substituted. So it's going to be um, the same kind of problem, but just change numbers around so it's a new instance. If you kept on going and you progressed and were successful, you'd actually move on to a different kind of problem. So it might have a, a completely different topic, or it might be another way of getting this concept of z-score. So if you didn't get it right, um, you would try it and tell you you're wrong. And so it's logging all this information. So you'd be able to attempt repeatedly. Well, at some point, you might get fed up or need a bit of help. And then you click the button that says Show Solution. And what that will do is show you line by line a worked out example. So there's been a lot of work in education psychology on by worked out examples. Um, and this doesn't necessarily engage with that literature, but it does map very nicely onto some of the ideas. 
So you click that, you can see the first line. So z score is defined as number of standard deviations and so on. Then you click it and it shows the next line. Then it keeps on going. And at some point you might figure out how to solve it and put in the right answer. Or eventually you would reach what's called an intelligent tuning system, the bottom of hint. So you just get the answer. And you can then plug it in and move forward. So you actually can't move forward unless you type in a correct answer. Um, or at least, you know, I mean, you could jump off of the problem and go to another part of the site and come back. But within this paradigm, that's what you'd be doing. So as you can see, um, imagine it's being repeated over and over. And this is how, you know, over months, students solve problems in this kind of framework. You might be logging in answers they make, whether they're right or wrong, how long they take, how many hits they ask for. But this is not pretty rich from the perspective of collecting data. But how would we embed an experiment in this context? And so hopefully it looks simple and elegant when you see it. Um, but hopefully it's not due to my limited intelligence. It took a while to figure out exactly the best way to do this. But actually, what we settled on was this paradigm of just inserting text at the top. So this is nice, one, because of the way Khan Academy is structured. Each of these is just a single HTML file. So if you change anything as text in these online environments, it's very easy to randomize in general. And here we've just made two versions of the file. Um, you can actually squeeze a lot through text. Um, here we're just going to show motivational messages. But in other studies, we've actually had hyperlinks that you click, and then it pops down and gives you more information. So you can actually teach someone a strategy by allowing them to request information. But so the experiment paradigm here then is um, we have a part of people are making um, conjectures and getting right or wrong answers. But what we can randomize is what's shown up here. What messages they see, what hints they're given, um, whether they're given hyperlinks to other pages, and so on. Um, one thing that's just worth noting quickly is this actually maps on a bit nicely to a category learning paradigm. So it's not exact, but in the same way you might see strange robots, um, or what are they called? Um, grapes? Or... Griebles? Griebles, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and, every, and every variation thereof. And classify them as Griebel or not. In a math problem, in this context, you're actually saying, is this math problem correct or not? And then you're asking, why is it correct? Why is it? And you're getting feedback about it. So it does map on in some ways. So here was the experiment. Uh, sorry, so the motivation of the experiment was trying to think what psychological um, experiment interventions have been really powerful. And even though I'm a cognitive psychologist, um, I'm a psychologist first in that I'm very impressed by data. So um, Carol Dweck has a line of work on how whether people believe in intelligence is malleable or fixed um, has a huge effect on all kinds of outcomes, uh, whether they give up easily, whether they persist. And the idea is that if you think intelligence is malleable, but you're willing to put in effort, and you believe that looking for the right strategies and ask questions helps you learn, if you think it's fixed, then basically every mistake you make is just a referendum on your ability. And so um, some pretty impressive correlation results. But recently, she's, um, there are several published interventions where teaching students that intelligence can be changed actually ends up increasing outcomes like grades. Um, I find it's hard enough to change a learning variable over an hour experiment. So I was pretty impressed to see it happen over several months from relatively minimal interventions, from uh, a month a month in a classroom to even down to a couple of days. So the idea is thinking now, how can we engender teacher growth mindset for students? And the sort of theoretical question is, to what extent is the effect of teaching someone about a growth mindset really just about positive encouragement, as opposed to the growth mindset, per se? OK, so the experiment design here was what I call the practice usual condition, um, a growth mindset message, where a simple message. Remember, the more you practice, the smarter you become. And so we had about 14 of those messages in the randomly assigned. Um, and so the first experiment comparison, um, which was conducted, as I mentioned, in collaboration with Joshua Stolikstein, who works half time at Khan Academy and played a huge role moving this forward, um, and also Cleveland Carol Dweck's lab, Dave Ponesco and Ben Hill and Carol Dweck. So practice as usual and growth mindset messages. And so this, this was done across 12 fractions exercises. And it was just aggregated very roughly across two months. So were people more motivated? So here I'm looking just at how many problems did people attempt over the entire course that these messages were being run right into their math problems. Um, they attempted a great number of problems. It wasn't numerically large difference, but it was about 1% increase. Um, and this is a tiny effect, but then I'm not actually sure how many people looked at those messages at all. So it's hard to measure whether that would be a lot larger if we did it in a, in a lab context with the same participants. Another issue is how many problems did they get correct on the first attempt? So not just try more problems, but actually end them correct. 
And here, again, you see the same one saying freeze. So they're not just being motivated and then flailing or making errors, but they're actually getting better. And if you actually look at the accuracy rate, so what's the number that they get correct in the first attempt divided by number 10? The growth mindset messages actually have an overall benefit. So just putting these tiny, small changes of message um, is actually increasing people's uh, success over a pretty long period of time. Okay, so you could be um, inter interpreting these. You might um, just think this is obvious. You know, why do you have to get two hundred thousand participants to go into that? Um, and another issue might be, well, you might be skeptical, especially as psychologists. So anything is statistically significant with that large of an end. So there's a second comparison that we actually run simultaneously. And so perhaps usual, growth mindset message, positive message. So for example, some of these problems are hard, but do your best. And so they run mice to one of these three conditions. So does any positive message work? And now you can imagine these three comparisons. It's a subtle difference, but the positive message is a label like that because something like this might be a tough problem, but we know you can do it. It's affectively positive. Um, it's as if someone's communicating with you, and it's actually putting text up on the screen. So it's controlling for a couple of variables at once. Whereas the growth mindset message is different in that it emphasizes you get smarter through trying hard. It tells you this is malleable. And this is really directly testing the idea that it's the growth mindset messages in this case might be working just by virtue of the fact that you're flashing messages to people or that they're encouraging and supportive in some way. Okay, so what's the effect of positive messages? So actually positive messages aren't any better than no message at all. So not everything is significant with a large sample size. It's not just that. <laughs> um, it still does better. And what's interesting is in the size one, we actually had adults judging messages and they thought they were equally effective. So that's the kind of basic experiment results. And in a way, I might be done there. Maybe it should be if time is limited. <laughs> <laughs> um, but actually, the kind of data that was collected really opens up a whole set of secondary analyses. So if we think about this from a data mining, or when I say modeling, it's not really modeling in the sense of the kind of richer models that Anna and Rob are going to present analyses about uh, presentations or processes. But I think I'm thinking more here in terms of characterizing patterns in people's behavior and statistical modeling. So if we think about adding fractions, dividing. Each of template can spawn many problems with different um, numbers. So you could, someone might try it once, twice, three times, up to 20, 30, it could get high. There were about 200,000 participants. And when I say participants, the thing about this is that it's, it's a lot less controlled than a lab study. We actually don't know who these participants were. The best we have is a marker of whether they've got a coach on Khan Academy, which usually means that they are associated with a teacher. People who've seen Khan Academy, if you went on this website, then you might have been in our experiment and bring off the data. So it's kind of hard to pull out <coughs> results from this. Um, students are also allowed a lot of freedom. So they can navigate between problems. If they want, they can just move from one to another. If they jump off or jump to a different part of the website, they can stop at any point and come back the next day. So it's rich in the sense that you almost have longitudinal data because this experiment ran for about two months. Um, but there are limitations in that sense. So the data we have is three months before, two months where the experimental intervention was running. And by that, what I mean is where when someone clicked on any one of these exercises, they were entered into the study, and they were either given nothing at all or one of the other conditions. And so for each problem, you can, we can look at whether they got it correct on the first attempt, 0, 1. How many hints did they request from 0, 1 to a dependent problem? One thing I'll note is on this site, at least, getting a hint, asking for a hint basically is graded as being wrong. So the idea is if you need a hint for support, then you got the problem incorrect. How long do they take on each problem? Um, the type of template of problem is an important independent variable. And so, again, the main point this was really just to start thinking and about the kinds of analysis you can do. So I'm really happy for people's thoughts in terms of pushing into it more. Um, but here are the kind of very basic preliminary results. So here I'm looking at more, um, judging what's the accuracy of on a particular problem where they got a zero or one based on the other variables. And in particular, now we're taking an experiment like the growth mindset experiment, and now we're sort of, in a way, expanding out that data set to see how do the experiment variables interact with other features. So the growth mindset messages helped increase accuracy. 
What's interesting is they actually also increase the chances that people request the hit. And so that's especially interesting because it makes sense that people are more willing to request help. But at least in this context, that actually hurts your accuracy. So the any benefit of growth mindset messages to learning is happening even though people being more likely to hit, ask for hits means they're more likely to get graded as wrong. Another thing the growth mindset messages are doing, which is again playing into accuracy, is actually increases how much time they spend on messages. So people may actually be thinking more carefully about it, or they may be thinking more carefully about what they learn from a problem. That's also something we can distinguish in this experiment. And we do have a bit of follow-up work that's in a more controlled setting. So again, very basic, but how does this experiment of inflation interact with student features or variables? It's not cor correlated with this measure of maybe students' prior knowledge or engagement, which is how accurate they were in problems prior to fractions experiment. And interesting, it's not actually influenced by this rough proxy for whether they're in a class or not, whether they have a coach in Khan Academy. If we look at problem features of variables, um, we are seeing that the effect of the mindset messages is larger for earlier items than later items, so it is decreasing over time. Right now, it's not totally clear how those mindset messages uh, interact with problem difficulty. I would have predicted that you might get a bigger benefit for harder messages. But at least when we've looked at problem difficulty, using uh, item response theory analysis that Khan kind of got me around over there, hold the set. Um, we aren't seeing results that I would say be uh, conclusive, be comfortable seeing anything since so not about yet. Okay. Um, so I just want to thank all the people who have to research in many ways. Um, and thanks for your time. <laughs> Maybe I can take one question as Rob sets up. Yeah. The, can you comment on the feedback that people get as they're answering the question what the feedback is big to a growth versus a fixed mindset? So it seems like the feedback is just correct, which is exactly. big to a fixed mindset. But if you manipulate the feedback saying you got it right, you worked really hard. Yes. No, I think that's a great um, question. It's not something that's easy to manipulate on Khan Academy's platform at present, but it is something I would predict would be beneficial. So. Um, one thing we're doing now, I mentioned a more control, well, not a more control, but um, a, a complementary platform. It's called Assistments, assistments.org. It's basically set up by a researcher at Worcester Polytechnic, Neil Happenon. And so he actually has a lot more affordances in terms of what feedback we can and can't give. He's actually pretty open to running experiments with researchers. But what we're doing is actually manipulating whether you get mindset messages before anything happens or only when you actually make a mistake. So instead of blasting people, refining it, as you said, for the kind of feedback. So hopefully we'll have results on that. There's lots of room in the gallery back there, and there's an attractive alcove that could hold at least four or five people. Um, there's laps that are totally free. Um, okay, great. So what I'm going to be talking about actually flows very well from what Jay was talking about with trigonometric identities. Uh, uh, we've been interested in for for a long time in how to get people to understand scientific principles that cut across different domains from chemistry to physics to social sciences to understand for example that all of these are examples of positive feedback systems right even if they're negative phenomena like global warming there's an underlying positive feedback system underlying it. Or to understand that all of these systems are diffusion-limited aggregation, even though some of them are very large scale, such as the growth of entire cities or Europe, and some are very small scale, such as the dielectric breakdown in, in electricity. Um, to understand that even though zebras and brains look very dissimilar to each other, there's very similar, in fact, really in some ways the same underlying reaction diffusion process that explains both of their properties. Um, and in ideal gas systems, where you have molecules bouncing around each other, um, there's actually the same underlying Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution of the distribution of, of kinetic energies as is played in simple economies that don't have any growth, but you have exchange of, of money randomly between the people. So we're interested in how to teach those kinds of principles, in particular in a way that gets people to transfer them. They learn about positive feedback systems with people being influenced by other people's body behavior, and we want to see whether it helps them in understanding global warming. Um, and so we think that this is important. We think this is the way that science should be taught. That's a different topic. Um, but we're 
um, very attracted to the idea of teaching these concepts using computer simulations because you want to be able to co-opt from the huge portion of our brain which is devoted to perceptual processing to understand concepts that would otherwise be too abstract to understand. Um, and there's excellent evidence, there was a recent article in Science Magazine last year arguing that these virtual laboratories, these computer simulations can be just as effective, in fact oftentimes more effective than actual hands-on physical laboratories for teaching transferable uh, materials. Um, so our particular slant towards what it means to understand and transfer these scientific principles is trying to train up people's perceptual interpretations. And this is exactly what Jay was talking about with the trigonometric identities. We think that you have to rig up your perceptual system according to training with one simulation. And then what it means to transfer is to, in some ways, leave that rigging in place when you're given a, a, a subsequent situation. So it's in very much uh, understanding transfer, which is oftentimes very difficult to achieve, but understanding it in terms of latent perceptual priming, where we know from a lot of research that if you give people experience with uh, the rat man ambiguous form, but you've preceded it with an unambiguous rat, then they'll naturally interpret it as the, the rat, whereas if you preceded it by the man, then you'll unambiguously interpret it as a, as a man. Right. So that's the kind of timing that we're going to be talking about. Um, okay, so this is where we're coming from theoretically, and where this has led us is to try to do something that seems ridiculously meta <laughs> by, by many accounts. We are interested in building a computational model of how students build mental models when they're confronted with computer models of natural phenomena. Okay, so why would you want to engage in something like that? Okay. Uh, one reason why we're doing this is to demonstrate how an interpreter, an agent, can uh, cross what Melanie Mitchell has called the semantic gap. On one side of the semantic gap, you have the perceptual, the sensory information. On the other side of the semantic gap, you have the, the meaning stuff that Jay was talking about, um, where you have the actual conceptual interpretations of what's going on. And so we wanted to have a model of how you could go from the perceptual stuff to something which is much more uh, humanly interpretable. Um, we're interested in predicting students' likely misinterpretations of simulations. Oftentimes an expert says, oh yeah, the simulation is obvious, but oftentimes the students, if you look carefully, are systematically misinterpreting these simulations. And we want to explain how are they seeing these simulations. Uh, we want to be able to um, potentially have a uh, a model of human scientific reasoning, um, automated tutoring, using these simulations so that we have to be able to put ourselves in the minds of the students to some extent. Um, and there's a long line of history of creating automated scientists um, along the lines of Bacon and AM and Dido and um, uh, Glauber and systems like that. That's not primarily what we're interested in. We're interested in students understandings for better or for worse. Okay. So our core commitments with um, uh, Sublime, that's the name of our system and it stands for something, um, is first that we have perceptually grounded inputs. Unlike a lot of these other systems, we want to have a system same objects within a movie of the simulation as it's unfolding. Um, because going along with our previous commitments, we believe that a lot of the training involves perceptual interpretations. Um, we are committed to the idea that what you want students to do is oftentimes experimentally intervene on the simulation by playing with the, the parameters of the simulation. Um, here's a good uh, case study of this um, using my collaborator uh, Uri Walensky's NetLogo system, and this is an ideal gas simulation. And so here you're seeing balls bouncing around. Down here you have the distributions which would be tied to the Boltzmann-Gibbs distribution. Um, and you can do various things like change the, the size of the box from a, a relatively small box to a relatively small box. And those are the, sim those are the kind of parametric manipulations that the students would be engaged in. Okay. So that's the kind of simulations that Does we're... screen get hotter? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And so that's, uh, that's the kind of simulations that we're exposing our, our students to. We've created some of them. Some of them 
and we just use the, the NetLogo versions of them. Um, and the, the final commitment from what we're talking about, and this is where the psychology is really coming in, is that we're trying to create, deploy psychologically plausible heuristics for determining what are the relations among the simulation elements. Okay, the entire system is quite, um, uh, quite elaborate. I'm not going to have time to do anything more than just cryptically point out aspects of this now. Um, part of it is what we think is partially implemented. Um, those are the green ones. The, the yellow is sort of in between, and the reds we, we really have not implemented at all yet. Um, so focusing now just like on the inspector. So you have the actual world, and you have the inspector which is looking at this world. And the first thing that it has to do is figure out persistent objects. It doesn't have this notion of an object across movie frames. The first thing it has to do is solve the object correspondence problem framed by Shimon Ullman, work with Mike, Michael Dawson, in order to figure out that this is the same object in frame one as in frame two. And it's only after that you've cre created these persistent objects that it even makes sense to talk about the speed of an object or the direction of an object. You can't talk about speed unless you have persistent objects. And in turn, once you've created the notion of speed and direction for objects, then you can begin to think about things like collisions. Because one of the evidence for collisions is going to be that these molecules that are bouncing into each other are changing suddenly their speed and the direction. So there's a dependency relation between speed and direction on collisions and pass-throughs. And then there's another dependency relation. Once you've seen collisions and pass-throughs, then you have a stab at getting at the notion of pressure in this area or in this volume because pressure is going to be the number of collisions that a particle has against a, a containing wall. Or that's one way that it could perceptually couch that out. Okay, so what I'd like to do now is actually, um, rather than go through the algorithm, I'll just show you what it looks like um, to give you some feel for, for what the system does. It's um, a dynamic geometry system, very much along the lines of geometer sketch pad or geogebra. If people are familiar with those. Uh, we hand-rolled it ourselves. Um, this is... Um, could be. So what I'm doing is I'm just going to be creating a simulation on the right-hand side. And I'm going to make a very simple simulation. I'm going to call this a, a wall. Um, I'm going to hide... I'm going to hide that middle dot. I'm going to create some balls in the middle. I'm going to select those. I'm going to call them balls. And now I'm going to um, hit all. And let's see whether it actually works. Okay, great. So now the balls are moving around because I hit them all. Um, and so I can set small ball bouncing equals true. And you should, when I do this, you should see them now bouncing off of each other. So they just switched there. Okay, this is all in the simulated world, or the natural world, if it, if it were. And that's not the, the interpretation of the system. Now, if I hit the, um, the eyeball here, then it is going to be interpreting the system. And so here you can see that it's, in some way or other, solving the object correspondence problems because you see that things tend to be moving from one frame to the next frame. Okay, and I could go over the algorithms for all of this stuff. What's, what's important here is every now and then you see these balls turning large. That's the detection of a collision relation. Okay, so these balls um, sometimes are colliding against the walls and sometimes Sometimes they're colliding against each other. And it's using heuristics in order to figure those out. Oh, that was interesting. I didn't do that. Um, it's uh, on its own, it's trying to um, play around with parameters in the simulation itself. So it's trying to co 
come up with its own uh, ideal gas laws, right? It's trying to come up with this notion of what is the relation between the area and the pressure. And it's getting some notion of pressure because it's looking at the, the number of collisions between these balls and the, the walls. It's looking at a lot of other things, but that's one of the things it's looking at. And so now it's um, trying to achieve some stability. It's trying to say, do I have a good enough basis of evidence to think that I've got enough uh, basis to make a, a law? And if it's not, if it's not, then it will do some other revisions, etc. So um, you can obviously control these parts, and you can play around. You can try to confuse its object correspondence algorithm, and you'd, you'd be able to eventually, probably. Um, so it's not a perfect system. But this is what we're we're dealing with now, um, and um, well, okay. There's a lot more I could show with this, but uh, how am I doing time-wise, Joe Joseph? Uh, you return to yourself. Okay, great. Okay, I'm going to start right now. <laughs> so <laughs> your your time is up. Okay. So, <laughs> so just to give you an example of some of the heuristics that we have, and these should seem very obvious to you. In order to detect a collision, you're going to tend to think a ball has collided with another ball or the wall if there's a, a, another ball or wall that's close to it, if there's a sudden change in direction and the speed of that ball, and if the particular way in which it changes its speed is exactly what you would predict if it had been colliding with this object that's uh, in front of it or that it's positing. Um, the fourth heuristic is um, if there's a lot of other heuristics a lot of other collisions going on in the background, then it will tend to interpret this otherwise ambiguous event as a collision itself. So um, there's a lot more to be said about this. Um, but what we've been trying to do on the first half is try to psychologically validate Sublime to see whether it creates similar object correspondences as people, whether it identifies collisions and pass-throughs in a similar way to people, um, whether it shows similar patterns of context, dependency, of motion correspondences. And there, um, the results are looking pretty good. Um, whether it does similar interventions as different classes of human beings, uh, uh, like David Clower's work on uh, whether children do controlled experiments. Um, and it's also able to create something akin to some of the ideal gas laws that we all know and love, like Boyle's Charles Law, and just the idea that pressure times volume should be proportional to temperature. So that's on the validating sublime side. But then what we'd um, like to go, and we're transitioning to, is um, trying to use Sublime as a way of validating other people's um, simulations of ideal gas laws, right? And so one of the things, for example, that we're, we're discovering from, from using Sublime is that this is the out-of-the-box um, net logo model for ideal gas laws. And what we noticed when we passed it through Sublime was that it was misinterpreting things. So they made a particular design choice, which was to have color coding of the molecules by their speeds, so that the fast molecules are red, the medium molecules are green, and slow ones are blue. And that confused Sublime. Because oftentimes, it would be forced to create a correspondence between these dots when the dot is actually not the same color as it used to be. And lo and behold, according to Shrona Levy, that's also a confusion that a lot of the students have. So there are some cases where we can use now um, uh, the model as a, as a way of critiquing actual pedagogical simulations. And there are other examples of that that I could give that may be only of interest to the, the people interested in ideal gas law simulations. But the broader applications of this are to look for um, reasons why a particular human or agent would be biased towards either a decentralized or a centralized mindset for interpreting a simulation. We're interested in trying to create principled choices for kinds of perceptual grouping that are, are worth fighting for. Right? And we're interested in also principled ways of, of figuring out whether particular proposals for pedagogical strategies for improving teaching are actually beneficial, such as concreteness baiting, scaffolding, and, and yoked models. Okay, thanks. Fill some seats on the floor for those of you if you'd like to see.
here. I need to oh, yeah. Is it still on the mirror? Um, I can actually have so a timer if you'd like. Hmm? Would you like me to run the timer? I'm going to have a timer up okay. for me. <laughs> You'll be able to run longer if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Um, maybe I'm gonna have a timer. Great. I'm Anna Rafferty. I'm gonna be presenting joint work with Tom Griffiths on using Bayesian inverse planning to infer learners' misunderstandings. And we've heard some today about the increasing number of interactive educational technologies where students use their knowledge while playing games, interacting with simula simulations and virtual laboratories, and completing other interactive activities. What I'm interested in is how can we diagnose students' understanding directly from these interactions, just as a teacher who observes a student can make fine-grained inferences about both what the student has mastered as well as in what specific ways she might misunderstand. This can facilitate personalization of guidance and instruction within educational technologies. However, it can be difficult to make these interpretations automatically. We must take into account both the context in which students are acting and the choices that are available to them in the environment. And these change across different activities, making it difficult to come up with one system that works in a wide range of technologies. So today, I'm going to tell you about our attempt to address that issue, um, a computational modeling model that we've developed that can allow us to interpret students' actions in interactive environments. And specifically, I'll focus on how this approach can be applied to uh, diagnosing students' algebra knowledge based on observing their equa algebraic equation solving. I'll end by briefly telling you about how using a generative probabilistic model can allow us to apply the same framework that we use for diagnosis of understanding to optimize the design of interactive activities to make them more diagnostic. Interpreting actions in interactive activities requires, taking, requires making sense of multiple actions that are taken over time. And so while algebraic equation solving might in the surface look very different than choices that are made in a game, it can be modeled in similar ways. Students must, be, must decide how to transform equations in order to reach a final answer. And the patterns in the choices and the way that they carry out transformations may tell us something about their understanding. So for example, take these two sample student solutions. They both start with the same equation. They both reach the same wrong answer. <laughs> um, they get there for different reasons, though. This student makes an arithmetic error, whereas this student misapplies the distributive property in a way that's actually characteristic of what stu some students do. So you might imagine if we could detect why these students got this problem wrong, or in general, their tendencies towards particular types of errors across several problems, then we could help them in more efficient ways than just having them keep doing algebra problems. This student might benefit some, from some practice on arithmetic. This student, maybe we could have her watch one of those videos on Khan Academy showing her about the distributed property and reteach that skill. However, most existing computer-based algebra systems aren't able to do that. Um, they make inferences about students' understanding either by structuring problem solving to make it more easily interpretable, or they only use the final answers. And we can see that in some cases, that isn't going to work. Instead, the approach that we take is to try to interpret students' free-form actions in order to make finite-grained inferences about the, what they understand and in what ways they misunderstand, just as we might imagine that teacher doing. The model, which we'll call Bayesian inverse planning, is modular in that the same information processing framework can be applied across different educational domains. And I'll tell you about a few of those domains today. So in Bayesian inverse planning, we first have to think about how do we formalize what it means to make a diagnosis of a student's understanding that's fine-grained. And we'll formalize that as a probability distribution over possible understandings, denoted here as T, given the observed behavior, in this case, the sequence of equations that the student writes down. Having a probability distribution is going to be helpful because it tells us not only what is the most likely understanding given the observed behavior of the student, but also how much evidence we have to support that. Are there multiple understandings that have similar probability? To apply this model to a new educational domain, the first thing we need to do is specify what is the space of, of misunderstandings that we want to uh, compute that distribution over. That's going to vary, obviously, a lot by different activities, different domains. In some cases, it might be as simple as a list. In the case of algebra, we turn to existing research that has done a lot of work thinking about what types of errors students make that can indicate differences in understanding. So a variety of different conceptual model rules that students noisily apply have been found. Students may also make arithmetic errors. And they might have issues in planning, difficulties getting from a large, complex equation down to a final answer. And what's interesting about these types of errors is that students might mathematically correctly manipulate uh, equations. You can't say 
this particular transformation was wrong, but they're doing so inefficiently. So we uh, associate each of these different types of errors with a parameter. For instance, there's a parameter that is the probability that a student will make an arithmetic error with any operation. And that's going to implicitly define a multidimensional space of misunderstandings over which we're going to compute the students, uh, over which we'll compute a distribution to diagnose the student. So how do we compute that uh, distribution? I just want to give you the flavor of what sorts of manipulations we're doing here. We're going to use Bayes' rule, which tells us how to update probabilities upon seeing evidence. So Bayes' rule tells us this is the product of the prior and the likelihood. We set the prior by using existing research from education and psychology, which has looked at, for particular populations and particular domains, what types of misunderstandings are common. And if that isn't present, we can use an uninformative prior. The likelihood is then a little bit more interesting uh, to think about how do we actually calculate this. It should tell us how, like, how likely the observed behaviors, in this case the equations, are if the student has the given understanding. But unlike in many traditional assessment contexts, the student's actions aren't independent uh, given her understanding, so we can't sort of take them in isolation. We also can't mark each action as right or wrong. We can maybe mark it as mathematically correct, but that's not going to translate to things like the actions the student takes in a virtual lab or the actions she takes in a game. So instead, the approach that we're going to take is to try to model students' action planning. What would they do if they had a particular understanding? That'll allow us to easily calculate this distribution, or this probability, and it'll also make it uh, give us a pretty flexible model that we can apply to other related questions beyond diagnosis. So to give you an idea of how we're going to model action planning, um, what we use is something called the Markov Decision Process, or MDP. Basically, this is a common statistical model used for sequential action planning when multiple actions must be taken over a series of time. And the consequences of those actions may be stochastic. And that's going to give us a lot of flexibility in the types of activities we can represent in this way. So each time step, uh, the MDP is in a particular state. So the state is based on the context of the educational environment in which the student is acting. In this case, it's based off the equation that they're manipulating right now. The student then chooses an action something like move a variable from one side of the equation to another. And based on the current state and the action that the student chooses, the MDP will transition to a new state. And the transition model is going to tell us about the dynamics of the environment. It's a set of conditional probabilities for what's, uh, what are the probability for each possible next state, given the current state in action, allowing us to reflect the fact that students' transformations of equations may be noisy. And in settings like educational games, they're often elements of chance. So we need something that's stochastic in that po at this point. Finally, um, we need to define why is a student acting in the first place? What are they trying to do? What are the incentives? And that's encoded by the reward model. In the case of equations, equation solving, we'll assume that students are trying to solve problems, get to a final answer form like a variable equals a constant or a constant equals a variable as quickly as possible. In something like a game, it might just be the point structure. So given this representation, we know that we can efficiently calculate the long-term expected value for taking a particular action in a given state. And what we wanted to think about was how can we think how can we think about that long-term action expected value in the context of what the student chooses to do? Um, so we assume that people behave as if they were noisily optimal. Um, that is, like some other recent work that has used MDPs to model human action planning. We assume that people generally take actions they think will have big gains, they'll help them to achieve their goals. But they don't do this deterministically. So that's almost enough to calculate. Uh, the probability of a sequence of actions uh, given some behavior, or given some understanding, but it doesn't tell us about understanding yet. I haven't said how does a student's probability of sequence of actions vary if students have different understandings. And what we're going to do is we'll incorporate that understanding as their beliefs about particular parts of the MDP. In particular, we'll represent their understanding as beliefs about what are the available actions, can they or can they not combine unlike terms, and how their actions affect the next state. What this is going to do is it means that um, we would expect that students will make systematically different choices in what actions uh, to carry out and in how they carry out those actions based on their understanding. And those systematic differences then allow us to take the observed behavior and draw insights into their understanding. So to step back, giving you an overview of the Bayesian inverse planning model, we start off by defining the space of misunderstandings. In this case, we have a sequence of parameters. We model the educational activity as an MVP, in this case, equation solving. And what we get back when we use inverse planning for diagnosis are these posterior distributions. So we generally get a posterior distribution over the whole space of possible understandings. That's the diagnosis. 
Here, for one of the parameters, you can see this student has a relatively high probability of making arithmetic errors, according to the model. In 25% of operations, they tend to make an error. So we've applied this model in several different contexts. In the lab, we've found that its inferences are consistent with the inferences of human and observer. And when applying it to data from a microbiology game played by middle schoolers, we found that its diagnoses were predictive of their scores in a more conventional assessment. What I've been telling you about today is applying this model to interpret algebraic equation solving, which is actually a more complex domain than some of the games that we've played up to previously. So I just want to tell you a little bit about some preliminary results we have. Um, using it to interpret human data, we wanted to see, is this actually, is this model expressive enough um, to model human equation solving data? And are its inferences uh, with uh, other measures? So we had people, well, we recruited adult participants, um, had them solve 20 problems on our algebra website with answering step-by-step problem solutions. We also had them complete an online worksheet um, that tested different mathematical skills in isolation. All of our participants had completed or had some experience with high school or college algebra, but hadn't completed post-secondary mathematics beyond that. So they followed our target uh, population of people with some algebra understanding, but perhaps with some gaps in their knowledge um, or some mis misunderstandings. The first thing we looked at was, can it actually interpret uh, people's transformations? The MVP model only is using a small set of possible actions. In theory, there are an infinite number of ways that people could transform equations. Is our model expressive enough to really capture this? We find that 98% of transformations can be interpreted using just a small sequence of actions, suggesting that people are actually only using a small number of actions. Um, and so this model is, people's behavior is amenable to being modeled in this, using an MVP. Next, we manually annotated a subset of people's equation solving behavior to, and we had the annotators categorize what types of errors they made so that we could see, does our space misunderstandings include most typical errors? And when an error occurs that our model could conceivably capture, is it actually able to identify it? We found that the majority of errors were part of our space of misunderstandings. And when a person made an error that the annotators categorized as being in that space of understandings, the model was relatively accurate at capturing it. So when it knows that that misunderstanding is possible, it can see those errors relatively well. There were some errors that were not, well, that were not captured in our model. Future work will expand the space of misunderstandings to better model all participants. And just to give you an idea, idea of what this model uh, gives us output, here's the skill profile for one participant. And it's giving us their skills along different dimensions. So for instance, this person is relatively inefficient at planning, actually gave up on a number of problems. Um, and that's the reason that this is relatively low. Higher would mean more efficient. However, they're not getting problems wrong because they're making arithmetic errors in general. Um, they have a relatively low inferred arithmetic error parameter. And in general, we looked across all participants and found that there was a correlation between the inferred arithmetic error parameter and their score on the arithmetic section of the worksheet. Um, so that's good, that's what we would expect to see. We have find also that there is not a significant correlation between the inferred arithmetic error parameter and their score on other sections of the worksheet, suggesting that we're not just getting at mathematical skill in general, but actually dividing out some different uh, dimensions there. So to conclude, inverse planning offers a modular way to diagnosing understanding from actions and interactive activities. We can apply it to different educational domains, and in some work that I didn't have time to tell you about, we've also used it to optimize the design of activities to make them more diagnostic. I'm happy to talk about that more if you're interested. The model has a lot of next steps that we'd like to take it with. We've done some testing of using it to direct uh, guidance to learners in the lab. We're looking at testing that for algebra learners uh, next. We're also interested in using unsupervised learning to induce the space of misunderstandings allowing us to practically improve educational applications as well as advance our scientific understanding of how student knowledge can vary within different domains. And thank you so much for your attention. Do you want to take a question and lose the switch over? Yeah. Uh, um, so making mistakes is one thing, but not knowing what to do is another. And you mentioned yes. that student who gave up on solving problems. Mm -hmm. um, that's always the problem with trying to find the solution to an algebra problem. Sometimes you don't know what magical step to take. Yes. And so is that something that your approach can capture? 
So it looks at planning, that is how well they're able to choose an action that's going to get them closer to the uh, closer to a solution with the correct form. Um, and so it can capture um, sort of people choosing badly, and when people give up, it thinks they've chosen especially badly. Um, it see. doesn't quite <laughs> capture um, <laughs> missing action, the sense of like, I don't know how to apply the distributive property at all, uh -huh. but I, and so I can't move on. Um, that's something that we could modify the model to do, but it's not in there right now. It'd be interesting to think. Yeah, well, so like in trig problems, for example, if you can't, if you, if you forget that you have to be looking for cases like one minus sine squared mm -hmm. theta and replacing that with cosine squared theta, you're never going to find the solution to certain right. problems. And um, I mean, those are a little bit more specialized and specific than most of the things, I guess, that apply here. But no, it'd be interesting to think about it. Um, right now, we have versions of the model, versions of understanding, where you consider too many actions. You think, for instance, you can combine unlike terms. And so you mm -hmm. could imagine a model where you're missing some of the actions, things like missing being able to replace a specific component with something else, and then looking at whether perhaps the best thing, given that you don't have that, is just give up. Um, and then we can follow that. Yeah. So it's my job to be the discussant and Joseph very generously gave me five minutes for a brief research talk, and I have about five minutes where I'm going to try to tie everything together, and we'll be out of here by our, our time, 5.20. Um, so first, the research talk. This is work uh, on improving long-term retention with personalized review, uh, and this is mostly by Rob Lindsay and Jeff Schroyer and how Hashler and I have been kibitzing along the way. So here's a basic fact about human learning people forget. Right? It doesn't matter what material or skills are being taught, the age or the background of the learner, forgetting happens. And even highly motivated learners aren't immune. Medical students forget 25 to 55% of, of basic science knowledge after a year, and more than 50% by the next year, and 80 to 85% by 25 years. <laughs> yeah. But you can't recall the answers to... Um, so for over a century, and everyone in this room and other psychologists have understood that forgetting is influenced by the temporal distribution of study. So spaced study produces more robust and durable learning than massed study. And so what we've done, and, and there's other projects of a similar flavor, is to try to reduce forgetting. Um, and we're doing this in a, an actual school by supplementing the standard curriculum with drill and practice software that uh, schedules spaced review. So the way it worked was we had an experiment with um, 180 second year Spanish students at a Denver area middle school. That's the actual, the actual students. Uh, and they got new vocabulary every week for 10 weeks. And the vocabulary includes phrases and simple skills like conjugating verbs and uh, turning present tense to past tense. And um, they, uh, in each, the students uh, use the software each three times each week for 30 minutes. And each the first two sessions, they studied their new vocabulary and skill list until they got to criterion. And whatever time was left over, they were allowed to, we, we were given that time to allow them to review. And then in the third session, they would take a quiz. And then again, whatever time was left over, they would spend on review. So they had, of this, uh, hour and a half, maybe 30 minutes of it was spent on review time. Um, so the software we have, I'm at University of Colorado. I didn't really introduce myself, sorry. Um, <laughs> but so we have to call this the Colorado Optimized Language Tutor, and or Colt. And it's a pretty standard drill and practice scheme where you see English phrases, you type in an answer that tells you whether you're correct or not and what the correct response is. And so embedded in this software that they were using in the school was a, a controlled experiment where we were comparing three different schedulers. Uh, we had a sort of mass review, which corresponds to their current educational practice, which is since they had new vocabulary each week, they would continue practicing that vocabulary, which is what the kids really wanted to do because they had to take a test at the end of the week. And in fact, I can tell you a long story about how they broke the software the following semester to avoid doing any other sort of review. Uh, we had a kind of generic spaced review, a sort of one-size-fits-all that says, sort of according to what we believe about 
space practice if they want to remember information for about a semester a week between experiences is, is reasonable so we had sort of practice of the previous week's vocabulary in this generic condition and then we had a personalized condition that um, did this adaptive selection of material based on the students uh, past performance and this was all done within students so we divided the material up into three sets for each student and during review the three schedulers took turns selecting items from their set um, so we get these very robust results because this is within student. So I won't tell you an awful lot about personalized review, but um, the basic idea is to take data from a population of students studying a set of items and feed it into a collaborative filtering scheme, which I'll explain in a second, um, to make a prediction about when a specific student should study a specific item. So collaborative filtering is something everyone's familiar with, even if you haven't heard the jargon. So when you go on Amazon and it makes a recommendation to you about what to buy, it's using data from this population along with a few purchases you've made to make a prediction customized for you. So if you just substitute customers for students and you substitute purchases with items to study, it's the same idea. What's missing from collaborative filtering approaches traditionally is time and the fact that there's forgetting. So we also have a model, a psychological model of human memory, and we integrated ideas from that model. That model by itself, I, we spent years developing, and then it turned out it was a really good model for predicting results from experiments, but it couldn't model individual differences very well. And so you take these two ideas and you put them together and, and we get something nice out of it. Um, and so the model could predict what a student should study at a particular time. So oop, I'm 11 seconds over. Um, here's the results from the final exam. Um, we had a cumulative exam at the end of the semester on entire course content. And then they came back a month later. This was uh, fall semester. So they um, had a month break and took a second exam. We split the material into two sets. Um, and so here's the first exam where the uh, mass is orange and generic space is red and the difference between their current educational practice and this personalized review condition is 12.5%. Uh, then a month later, unfortunately, there's forgetting in all conditions, uh, but because there's more forgetting in the mass condition, uh, the, the difference goes up even higher. And I'm totally blown away that we're getting this re result robustly because, again, this is about 30 minutes of the week when the students are doing review compared to the, all the time they're reading the book, doing exercises in class, interacting with the teacher, doing homework. So there's all these horrible, horrible confounds that you, we can't control for. Right? So that's my result. And I can tell you about what's going on this semester if you want to ask me later. But I want to move on and, uh-oh, yeah, there we go. Um, talk about computational modeling, which is the focus of this symposium. So um, process models have dominated the field for the last 40 years. And Jay's work over the years has shown that sub-symbolic accounts often provide a more satisfying explanation um, of learning than symbolic accounts. And Jay gave us a talk where he used this approach to understand the emergence of foundations of mathematical com competence. Um, and there's clearly directions that you can take that idea, and I think that's reflected in Rob's talk, um, to sort of ground models in perception to do higher mathematical reasoning. Um, so that's one class of models that I, I would say is well represented by Jay's work. But this symposium had a, a contrasting sort of model, which um, is, is sort of the thing that's being revived thanks to the big data movement and the uh, resurgence of interest in purely predictive behavioral modeling. And I call them neo-behaviorist models, where instead of focusing on the mind, let's focus on the data to learn about um, and predict human behavior. And um, Joseph Che's talk was a nice reflection of that, where he was just going through the data to try to see what, what features correlated with the improvements that he saw. So I tried to lay these out on a continuum with, with Jay's work at one end and Joseph's on the other end. And um, I think we can put Rob's work squarely sort of on Jay's side, where you're really trying to model the processes of cognition. It's not quite as far as Jay's work, because uh, Rob's model is just a model that he thinks is a sensible model of how people function. And uh, it's yet to be determined whether it's a 
accurate model, but it certainly seems to have that right grounded flavor that Jay and Rob talked about. Um, Anna's work is interesting because it's somewhere in between. She has a psychological theory of representational states and, and has used data from experimental work to sort of set the priors of these different representational states or knowledge states. But her model isn't a process model of human thinking. She says, let's take this model of representation along with the assumption that actors are rational. And um, from that assumption of rationality, you can make inferences about the learner's state. And my work is somewhere sort of even a little further along the line where I know I gave this sort of cover story that we had this model of spacing effects, but really we're using the data to tell us what's going on. And by the time we got things to work, what, what was actually left of the psychological model was much less than um, this more interesting kind of uh, latent variable model that was making inferences about knowledge states purely from data. And we had enough data that we could do that. Um, so that's one dimension along which these talks vary. And I went back to Joseph's title for this session, and I figured, well, OK, we've taken care of computational modeling. <laughs> um, so now let's talk a little bit about learning. So some of the models here, I, I, I didn't sequence this all. Some of the models here describe the dynamics of learning. They predict how learning unfolds over time, how it unfolds with experience. Uh, Jay talked about learning over the developmental time scale. I talked about forgetting and, and learning over the course of a semester. Joseph talked about determining for whom and at what point an intervention might be effective. Um, but other models on the right there use instantaneous knowledge uh, that really are focused not on time per se, but on describing instantaneous knowledge state and using the individual's current behavior to reverse engineer the knowledge state. And I would say that Rob's work, as he's talking about it right now, and Anna's work falls into that category. Um, so and now we've dealt with learning. And so we're la left with this last phrase. And so Joseph has given me the two categories. We have basic processes on the left and real world education on the right. And these basic processes are, are well studied by traditional laboratory studies. And I think one of Joseph's motivations for holding this symposium is that there's now this other opportunity to situate these experiments and models in real world education settings. Um, and you have to collect data in a very different way. Um, you have much less control, um, yet you can still conduct controlled experiments. And the real world setting affords an opportunity to do real time prediction, analysis, intervention that's reflected, I think, in all the talks that um, people have presented. Um, I didn't really know where to put Rob on this one, so he got faded. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let me just wrap up with a, a, a stick on the role of computation, since it's, that's the one theme that tied these talks together. Um, from a cognitive modeler's perspective, the kind of claims that we all made were that cognitive theories can guide these educational interventions. From a neo-behaviorist modeling perspective, that you can argue that you can squeeze every last bit of information out of the data and use that to suggest novel or targeted interventions. And uh, in either case, we're exploiting computational tools to do that. And um, we had a... Google Hangout to discuss the symposium, and one of the presenters, who I will leave nameless, said, running around like a headless chicken and just trying out things. <laughs> OK, it was Rob who said that. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so don't be headless chickens for a model. Thanks. <laughs> Since we're in time, but it would be a few lots of questions. Maybe two or three people just state your questions and then come up and discuss them, but just so everyone can hear it. If they don't have any questions they want to ask. What are you doing next semester? <laughs> so, so, so we sorry, we don't have time to ask them. We just want to go. Yeah. When you're talking about how uh, you can see the same uh, math problems, like the same type of math problems. 
that uh, the effect of seeing for the first time would be different after they're in feedback than when they saw uh, the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you see any differences in data between the first time that they try to think of the proper strategy versus when now they know what strategy to use. I'm sorry, I can't oh, break the rule, but <laughs> you have a question, Yeah, I'm just um, wondering for, for all the speakers, um, in the long run, how would you see conveying these findings to educators? Like, do you think you would have something that you would tell a teacher? Or do you think that they would be strictly useful in the context <coughs> of like intelligent tutors and uh, gamers? Any other questions? <laughs> okay, well, please come up and chat, and we can ask some of this. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been a symposium like that. <laughs> So, so I said that we're getting kicked out. I actually don't know that we're actually getting kicked out. Oh. I mean, I, there is some oh. So what we're doing, we, we just had the, the grand ballroom for this semester. Yeah, so this semester yeah. we added. Yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I thought I was doing this. We're talking about the grand ballroom. Yeah, I know. Maybe two days. I guess it's two days. I can't. Yeah, I can't. It's one of our first times. I and we have yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, finding a little yeah. 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 Yeah.